Jenny. Well, welcome to the And She Spoke podcast. Today, we're going to talk all about pricing and the patriarchy. It's the best title ever, isn't it? It really is good. I think it's really good. I think you came up with it. I did come up with it. And you were like, oh my God, we're using that. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. And this is a a topic that we discussed in our virtual conference this um, past September. So we're going to revisit it here on the podcast because we got so much great feedback on this topic. And we're just going to cover a little bit of what we covered in that virtual conference session and just kind of riff on some of the points a little bit. And um, we'd love to hear all of your thoughts on this conversation too, at some point. Yes. I think, uh, teaching in that format is a little bit more like point, point, point. And so we just wanted to be able to discuss and go all over, just see where it takes us. Okay. Let's talk about patriarchy and the pricing and pricing. Um, do you want to talk about worth first? I feel like that's like where we need, I just need to explain those two things before we really dive in. Is that all right with you? Yes, ma'am. So you, Sandy, are going to talk about the difference between the, like your worth, your self-worth and the worth of your programs and yep. offerings. Yeah. Yeah. And because I think we get this so mixed up and it can be really painful and we just, I want to just teach everyone how to separate those two things. So we're talking about you as a human being, your worth versus your program's worth or your membership worth or the, whatever you're selling, the worth of that. And it's really important to know that you as a human being on this planet today are worth everything, anything that you want, all of your desires, you are worth it. Your worth is inherent Mm -hmm. and it is not to be conflated with what you are selling. So when we are in business, when, well, not even in business, even if we have a job and, um, we go and ask our boss for a raise and people and girlfriends and friends are being supportive and saying, go get paid what you're worth. And I think that it's just, it's a bit of a dangerous statement. And so you march in there and you ask for a raise or more money. And if that boss says no, or that employer says no, um, we make it mean that we're not good, that we're not valued, that we're, you know, we're not, you know, we make it's, it's a painful thought because it's like somehow, I am not worth that money. And so what I would switch that in that scenario is like, what I would ask, like, what can you do to increase the value that you bring at your job Mm -hmm. to warrant that increase in, um, salary. So when we talk about entrepreneurs, um, you know, we are out there selling and marketing all the time. And sometimes we get no's, right. People aren't ready. They are, but there's a hundred reasons why people wouldn't buy whatever you're selling. And if we don't have a, if we have a, you know, sort of a lower than expected launch or, um, you know, some people say, no, we make it mean that somehow we're not going to doing a good job. And so I just really want to separate those that the program is an exchange of value. It's up to the client to determine if that value is worth giving you money or not has mm-hmm. nothing to do with you. So as we talk about pricing in the patriarchy, we're not talking about your self-worth, we're talking about your program or your offerings. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Or what is your work worth in our economy right now? Right. Like it's about, you know, we undervalue, obviously there's all this invisible hidden work that goes on hidden labor, like mothers (laughs) with the the work that mothers create. Right. And our, and and the problem is that our culture does not place a monetary value on a lot of work that is very, very valuable. And so that's a whole deeper conversation, but I like your point, Sandy, that it's about what is your work worth to someone who's willing to pay for it versus what are you worth as an inherent human being? Yeah. You're worth everything, right? Totally lovable, totally worth everything. So yeah, I just think, especially for women, I think that, that, um, we have been taught that our value comes from how hard we work. And if we don't you know, get the money that we want, then we're like not valuable. Right. So there's a whole spiral that we can go into that, go into. So, okay. Let's talk about, we wanted to kind of hit four um, subconscious beliefs that are affecting women when they price and they come from the patriarchy. Thank you very much. So um, let's just first pause and talk about what subconscious means. So um, a lot of this, the material that we're going to present here today is about beliefs that we have that are not, you know, we may not be aware of them. They're subconscious. They are there. They are programmed from childhood. We learn them from watching TV, movies, books, magazines, 
culture, our aunt, whatever, right? So, but they're deep, they're there, they're influencing us and we just don't realize. So we wanted to bring these four beliefs forward so we can examine them and you can sort of ask yourself how they are affecting you and your business and your pricing. Ready? What's the first one, Sandy? <laughs> the first one, first one is that women are less smart, less deserving, less capable than other people. Where does that come from? <laughs> this is ancient. <laughs> this one, I, this is fascinating to me. So this one is, um, and I, I, I want to say too, like when we talk about the patriarchy, men and women have these beliefs, right? Men believe this about women and women believe this about themselves. So historically men have been, you think about like ancient Greek times and, um, you know, old philosophers and so on, men are valued for their mind, for their thinking, for their intellect, for their reason, for morality, for virtue. And mm -hmm. women historically have been valued for their body, sexuality, procreation, um, emotions and, and work. Right. And so we, again, if you just imagine that that's operating at a very, very deep level, of course, you get upset when someone isn't saying that, you know, your work, your program or your work is not worth it. Um, so the other point I want to make here too, Jenny, real quick is that women have been associated with bodies, as I just said, and that we have been treated, and this might be a little bit more of a white woman thing as an, as a dependent, right. That we mm -hmm. are reliant on a man, a boss, a father to survive. And that is mm -hmm. like deep in our psyche that we cannot make decisions for ourselves, that it has, someone else has to come in and decide for us when it's certainly when it comes to money and those kind of decisions. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally see that showing up for myself and for everyone that I know. Um, and so what is like, what are some of the things we can do about that? Well, I think the first is like to recognize, like we're not taught that we are capable and deserving and, mm -hmm. you know, good making, good with making decisions and good with, um, leadership and so on business. We're not deserving of our own business. We're not deserving of wealth or money. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't know, I kind of get like a little fired up about that and say like, no, I'm not going to accept that belief anymore. Now we, if, if this is true for you, that somehow you believe that you are less deserving or less capable, mm -hmm. then we need to like acknowledge that that is there and then start to move into, well, what do you actually want to believe about what you're capable? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you want out of your business or your salary or whatever? Um, we need to start just rewriting that because those are not hard coded in us, right? They are there. Once we know they're there, we can decide how else can I look at, um, what I want out of my business, like start saying how capable I am. I am totally capable. I'm totally deserving. Yeah. And I think that what some people might be thinking right now, as they're listening to this and definitely resonates with me is that like, I can do the work with my own thoughts to see myself as capable, or maybe I never was as influenced by this subconscious belief. And yet this is the other thing to note about the patriarchy that it's, it's obviously internalized, but it's also still very external, right? So even though you may do the work internally, mm -hmm. um, you, and, and, and change the way that you think about your abilities, when you're working particularly outside of your business, like if you're working for someone else, you have a corporate job or, you know, you have an employer or you're, you're running into other kind of barriers. Some of that is not just internal, right? There are still very real structural barriers to you rising or achieving the way that you set out to do. And so I think that that then can reinforce the internalized mm -hmm oppression mm -hmm. as well. Right. So it's, it is a dance and we recognize that the beautiful thing about business is that like you, you get to run up against, you still have them, but fewer of those structural barriers, because when you are the boss, you know, you don't have at least that one layer there right. sitting on top of you, right. telling you, you no. do have, you know, uh, an uncle or a father or yeah. a brother going, 
like, you're not going to, you can't charge that or you can't make that or whatever, like those, like, or what a cute little business. You yeah. Have. Like your little hobby. It's so cute. What a sweet little thing you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. fun your so, little yoga business <laughs> yeah, as people tell right. us. We, yeah. We've heard that a lot in the conference. <laughs> Um, so when, just to bring this back to pricing, um, so if you're sitting to trying to put a value on your program, you may fall into the trap of believing that you don't know how to price, right? You don't know how to do this. This is complicated. It's super hard. Um, the other thing that we see in our community is like, and this is fascinating, Jenny, I want to hear your take on this where people like, okay, I've got, I've I've got this thing I'm going to sell and I'm going to look around and I'm going to take you know, look at the data and see what everyone else is pricing, which they should and which you should. But then they're like, okay, the average is let's say a hundred dollars. I'm going to go 70, Mm -hmm. right? They go below what they almost always. And like, why? And this is why, but like, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there is this general theory that if you're, if you charge a little less, that people are more likely to buy from you, which is not true. I think we get that hammered in from, you know, like, Amazon and Walmart and like sort of some of the bigger corporations that we interact with in our culture that like cheaper is better and matching Mm -hmm. prices and whatever Mm -hmm. else. So some of that is that. And then I think the other part is about worth, right? Like that we just think, oh, well, I am not as good as, you know, I I don't want to, I don't want people to think that I think I'm better than anyone, or I am as good as X, Y, Z person. So I'll just go a little less. Mm-hmm. you know, and it's a safer comfortable. place to price. It's, comfortable it's more to comfortable. Mm-hmm. No one's going to accuse me of being expensive mm-hmm. because I, I think we're honestly afraid as women in general of being, um, audacious in our pricing or being too conceited and thinking that we're too valuable. Mm-hmm. You know, we have personally wrestled with this like for years, we are constantly told how expensive our software is. And, you know, it's just absolutely actually not true. If something is free or really cheap, and we have ranted about this on the podcast, there is a reason it is cheap. You are paying in some other way. You are paying with your attention. You're paying with your data. You're paying with your privacy. (laughs) You know, you're paying, um, you're being subsidized by certain venture capital that you might not understand you know, the external costs associated with something being cheap or free for you. Like there, there are, there, there's no free lunch, right? It's that whole saying, like there is no free. So when something is artificially cheap, there's like usually a very, you know, (laughs) dangerous reason why it's cheap or free. And, and, um, you as a small business, like as an individual entrepreneur, or, you know, someone growing a small team, you can't, afford to act like that. Like you're not playing that same game and it's actually dangerous to your ability to support yourself, your ability to pay people, you know, a living wage when you start to under price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard an expression and, um, that the tallest poppy gets that their the it's head cut off that that's kind of what we're afraid of. Right. Like I don't want to be the most expensive, but I do think to bring this to the patriarchy, I do believe that if you see the average is a hundred and you go 70, it's, there's something driving that, that it's like, I am not deserving. Yeah. I am. I am not matching where I am not as good as I am not as capable as I am not as talented as, you know, those are lots of thoughts about yourself that you're just like, I'll just sneak in here under it's so much more, um, it's easier and more familiar and more, you know, as we said, much more comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Belief number two, Jenny is women are not to be trusted with money. Women have been taught and demonstrated throughout culture that we are not good at making it. We are not good at having money. We're not good at choosing what to spend our money on saving it, investing it, all of that. Um, and I think that if we think about, you know, we just think about movies, how women are portrayed, like rich women are total bitches, right. Or women are on ridiculous shopping sprees and buying trophy wives. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> buying, yeah. um, you know, designer handbags and shoes and so on that we're like impulsive, that we make really poor buying decisions, like spending money unwisely. Yeah. And, um, so when we go to spend money, like we question ourselves, like, is this a good decision? I really shouldn't be trusted. I'm I, how many women have you heard say that I let my husband or partner make them the financial decisions? Oh yeah. A, a lot. I don't relate to this at all. So this is harder for me to like 
understand at a gut level. But yeah, I mean, I saw that within my own family and I see it with friends and clients. I think there is a real problem with financial literacy in general. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I think people are not taught basic financial literacy. And I think it's, it's like exponentially worse for, for people who are socialized as women. So I just would say that, yeah, that's, you know, like that's all by design to me. Like it's very clearly by design. We were looking, do you remember a couple of weeks ago, Sandy, I was showing you, I I'm kind of obsessed about this, like dichotomy on YouTube between like real Mm -hmm. estate investors Mm -hmm. being like all like almost all like mail run channels and then coupon clipping. Like I buy all my groceries for a family of seven at Walmart for $10 a week. Like those are like these women budget, budget channels. And, um, and I, like, I just wanted to see like, if I could demographically figure out like who are the biggest real estate investors and like are there women in this group and, and like, why not? And I started to just go down a rabbit hole online. And I found this article (laughs) about the top 25 real estate investors in the U S and it was just like this horrifying scroll of like, you know, like men, like old (laughs) men, like, and like Donald Trump was on that list and like a whole bunch of other people that look pretty much like that. Um, and I was just like, wow, this is really interesting. Cause, cause like real estate is a, as a, a very powerful way to grow wealth quickly. And that's not what we talk about and you know, whatever, but, but it's just like to contrast that to coupon clipping and like budgeting for family groceries, like is mm-hmm. just, just the, like the, you know, where, where you spend your attention and your time is like what grows in your life. Right. And so when you're spending your time, like figuring out how to make $200 last a month on groceries, you're not thinking about like what kind of 401k, you know, investment should I make, or what kind of real estate investment should I make? Or how can I like leverage debt in order to like double my net worth in the next 24 months? Like you are focused on something that there, there's nothing wrong with like budgeting. And I think, you know, budgeting is responsible in, in generally speaking, but when you are so hyper-focused on pennies, you're not thinking about millions, right? Like your mm-hmm. brain can only focus yeah. on one or the other at a time. Yeah. yeah. So that's the next, um, I'm going to do this out of order. Cause that that's a nice segue to the next one, um, is money is scarce. Like women are taught that right. Then, which is, which is what you're just saying. It's super hard to come by. It's hard to get, it's hard to earn. It's, you know, you have to work really hard to get any money. You have to be very cautious with your money. You have to be very safe, hold on to it in case there's an emergency. Um, and we shared this, uh, in the conference, we shared in, uh, this study that, um, from 2018, they looked at 300 different financial articles. Um, and they found that 90% of the articles aimed at women advised them to cut back on their spending. Yeah. So it was like, it's stressful. It's scary. It's hard. Be careful. Like you don't, you, you know, you don't really know how to do this. And the, the, what the end result is uh, of that is that women are emotional victims of money. Men, on the other hand, when they looked at those articles were like portfolios and investments and real estate and like power and leadership and wealth building. And so it's like, they're completely two different messages. And again, we may not be aware that we're, we're reading these articles, but we're not understanding like how these beliefs are kind of set, um, Mm -hmm. you know, deep and internalized. And so I think this is really, really interesting that, you know, men are like, invest, there's lots of money, you can do this. And women are like, hold on to it, hold on to it, hold on to it tight. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's absolutely true. And I, I wonder if it's just because like how much of that is intentional versus like, I don't know. And by design versus just like this, side effect of the patriarchy, you know, like it's maybe not the intention. I don't know. I think about that a lot, even about fashion. And, and I think about like how much time I spent, like, I mean, first of all, if you enjoy fashion, that's great. But like, I've, you know, all of us, I think like they grew up socialized as women and girls spent time reading like Vogue and Vanity Fair and like fashion magazines and set like, um, I think about, you know, when I was wanting to save for things growing up, like it was to save up for things that like, so that I could 
you know, buy something like that, that's, that's going to immediately decline in value. And, you know, really is, I mean, I think the entire fashion industry is absurdly addicted to like, you know, having you change out your wardrobe every single season, right. And, and dump all your money into that. And like, that's, I mean, maybe with like certain, you know, like vintage and like reselling apps and stuff, you can get some money back for things, but like, it really is like this, you know, it's not a strategic way to spend your money. And like, I feel like men are like from a very early age taught to invest and like, you have to save for a family and you have to, like, you're the person who's in charge of creating safety and security for your family. So you have to think about those things. Mm -hmm. And so if we talk about women who are pricing and who believe that money is very hard to come by, um, you're going to have thoughts like there just isn't enough money. I want to charge these prices, but I don't want to take from the clients. Like I feel bad that I'm taking their money. I don't, um, there's, we hear a lot, like I don't want too much or I don't need too much. Like I don't expect to make too much. And, um, this really plays out, uh, in our audience, of teachers and coaches, you know, specifically in wellness, they, a lot of them come from the arts, have an arts background where like money, you just, you do not make any money. And to kind of switch it to this entrepreneurial mindset online, where there's no ceiling, it's very, very hard because you have been programmed for so many years that it's like hard to get money, hard to get people to pay you. There's not enough. And there's a lot of guilt, you know, when you receive money. Like it's really hard to take money in because you feel bad because you feel like you're, you're taking from somebody. Mm -hmm. But when we talk again about value, like you have to remember it's, there's two sides of this coin that you are, yes, you're taking money, but you're also giving an incredible program or workshop or whatever, where that they are getting value, equal value, in fact, and they, they see or it that more, way. they're getting more than their money. And that's why often. they've, they've agreed to it because yeah. you, they're like, it's worth it to them to give you the money. So, yeah, I think that's totally, I, I think thinking about that energy exchange is the way I, I feel like a lot of folks in our community think about it. And I think that's a very helpful way to think about it is that you're getting, you know, energy in the form of, of financial currency in exchange for the energy of whatever it is that you're offering the transformation or the, you know, the experience or whatever the results. And I think that's one way to, to think about that. And I, I think that we also, um, are socialized to play really small in the economy around this. Like I, when I, when I think about those concerns and I hear them from clients and I hear them from folks in our community, my thought always goes to like, yeah, but if, if you play this game, like who has all of the money, like who, if you're not willing to take a bigger slice of the pie, which obviously, you know, if we're working with you, we <laughs> think you're wonderful and believe in the vision you have for yourself in the world. Right. But you know, where, you know, who's going to have all the money then, right? Like if you're playing, if we're all playing small, where like, it's going to be the exact same people who've always had all of the resources. And I think I learned really quickly w- growing up working in the political world and in the nonprofit world that, you know, it is like these, um, there's no clean money, right? Like it's, it's like when you're doing even charitable work, that money came from standard standard oil, you know, it came from like the Rockefeller family. Like you have to think back or think deeply or think in a layered way about where, like where money comes from and how it circulates. And truly, if you believe in your own vision and your own work, which you should, if you're an entrepreneur, then you should want as much money and as much, you know, as many resources as possible to spread your vision and your mission for what you're doing. I guarantee you that there is infinitely more than you could ever think that you want, you know, available to you. And that it's, there's like you playing small and all of us collectively playing small is just keeping the money and power in the hands of the same people who have always had it and who Mm -hmm. have created a world that a lot of us feel is, um, you know, has a lot of room for improvement. And I just, I really want to caution, um, to think of it as a pie. Um, it's not a bigger slice of a pie or a smaller slice. Cause that's like the limited scarcity yeah, yeah. kind of mindset. It's like they're in, then you just said there, like there's abundance. There is, it, there is like unlimited money out there in the world. And how do you show up in your business? If you believe that, like you're not taking from anybody, there's like unlimited and you are deserving of whatever amount that you, that you want to make. 
So, okay. So I want to use that again as a segue into belief. The last belief, which is a woman's success is determined by whether others, um, approve of her or not, or please with her or not, which is the people pleasing, yeah. um, concept women. Um, and this goes back to the fashion point that you made too, is like women are taught to evaluate themselves, to judge themselves, to criticize themselves against other people and decide their worth. You know, do I look pretty enough? Am I kind enough? Do I sound okay? Because the whole goal is to look a certain way and gain approval from, um, society, be a good girl, smile, you know, all of that, that kind of, um, thinking, um, and I think what we heard um, in when we presented this in the in the conference was like there's such a fear of showing up and doing the work that you really want to do, but there's this judgment. There's going to be people who say that oh that's too expensive or you're not making enough or yeah, and they will yeah, and that's okay. That's the yeah. <laughs> that's the lesson. There is a fear around it, and guess what? there's a lot bigger fear. Like there's a lot more to be afraid of. Like, this is nothing. Of course, people will say that because it, it, when you show up and you're willing to behave differently than what you've been socialized to behave as it's threatening to other people, right? Like you're not playing the game anymore. And mm -hmm. so whenever we, any of us step outside the bounds of the game and the game has been predetermined by the patriarchy, then we are obviously a threat to you know, the people who are still playing the game, like mm -hmm. it's destabilizing in includes women too. This is not oh, just yeah. men. It's Heck like yeah, women it will use the patriarchy against yeah. other women. And we also use it against ourselves. And yep. these are the, these subconscious beliefs are us exactly doing that. Exactly. Like yep. playing into this, this belief system that keeps us quiet. The other thing that I've been thinking about last couple of days is this idea that women, when they create their businesses, when they set their pricing, they just want to be affordable to everyone. And that is still trying to like, my success is determined by others are pleased with me. And so, um, we had this question come up about, um, about that. So what do you think about just like, I got to be affordable. Yeah. Well, we have a, I think a collective point of view on that Sandy and the way that we've chosen to handle that concern in our company is to create incredible free resources. I mean, we spend time and attention obviously on this podcast, on our blog, like creating content that is free and available that comes at a real cost of, in terms of time and resources to us. And we are committed to doing that. Like there is always going to be part of our work that's free and part of our best work that's free and available. And that's, that's part of like why we do what we do, right. Is to create a, a shift and a transformation in the economy. And so we don't gate all of that behind our paid offerings, but at the same time, our paid offerings, you know, we're a business and we need to support support ourselves and our team and we're building a company and we need to do that in a responsible way. And so we don't, um, underprice or we work really hard not to underprice our offerings because then it wouldn't the business would die right like if the money isn't coming in to justify the expenses like that's you know basic arithmetic like your business won't work and 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 the other thing is i think a lot of people do is they think like i'm just going to be really cheap and i'll um you know, I'll make money in some other way. And that's, that's totally fine. If that's like in your heart and that makes sense for you, but are you holding back on your real vision for yourself and your, and your business and your dreams, because you're, you're choosing to play that way when you are not willing to fully commit to your business, like it, I can promise you, it's not, you're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to really grow. Like it's, it's really, yeah. you have to be really focused to grow a yeah. company. I just want to say business. like, how's that working out for you? How's that yeah. working out for you? It doesn't right? work. So we, we say the, we say this all the time and people are like, well, I just don't, I just have to, like, I just, I don't want to like exclude people, which is the root of that is like, I need others. I need to please others to yeah. be worthy. And, um, it's like, okay, but how is that working? Right. And what we hear is like, it's a struggle. There's resentment. I can't, I'm working so hard. I'm burning out. And this is like the antidote to that is charge what you need prices so that you can make what you need to make. Yep. And I also think there's a side of this, like 
you know, what are you doing to the industry when you do, when you charge less as well? I, I know some people have partners that make decent money, right? And so they're like, oh, I don't need to make it. And that's fine. But like, it, because you're charging low prices, what about all the other women who do need to, you support know, themselves, put, put food yeah. on the table and buy yeah. school supplies for their children and so on. The work should stand on its own and it, you should charge whatever it's worth, regardless whether you need that money or not. Does yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that we don't often think about the repercussions on other people from the decisions that we make in our business. And like we should, we should, that's part of being socially responsible is to figuring out like, okay, well, if I take something that, you know, others are charging for and I make it free, like, is, is that, or I make it really cheap. Is that, you know, responsible because there is this, that like, this is why we don't have a marketplace product, right? Like we don't marketplaces like by definition, create a race to the bottom. They commodify, you know, everyone's efforts and everyone's work. So that's like why Fiverr is Fiverr, right? So, you know, as an entrepreneur, like, I think a lot of us have used Fiverr and it's an, it's such an interesting concept, but like really a logo shouldn't cost $5. Like the person who is designing that logo is not being paid properly if you're paying $5. And that this is the danger of a marketplace where it is just a race to the bottom and everyone is making decisions based on lowest price. So you don't want to, I mean, I would encourage all of you to think very critically about whether you want to play in that game, because that is a game that is like, I I can tell you someone is making a boatload of money off of that. And it's not you, it's not any of the service providers and it's not, you know, it's, it's investors. That's who, who makes money in that model. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about like, who do you want to make money for? Do you want to make money for you and your family and your team? Or do you want to make money for someone else who has the resources to invest, you know, venture capital into something? And I, I mean, we are very much focused on, really redistributing wealth to regular people who are doing hard, good work, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not about lining the pockets of people who already have infinite piles of money. So Mm -hmm. I always think about, um, like mother Teresa traveled on a private jet. Yeah. Like you can't be poor enough to help the poor, you know, like that, that kind yeah. of thinking, like you can't be cheap enough so that everyone is accessible and you're helping everyone. Like you've got to, and women again are socialized to believe that they need to take care of everyone first. And this is another, you know, arm of that where like, let's just do this, you know, this $5 a month membership and um, everyone will be really happy and I'll be able to help everyone except for you. And when you're like not making any money, unhappy, struggling and burnt out and you're like, oh crap, I think that was a mistake. Right. But that's like, I just, some of those, those examples where there's people who did amazing work in the world, they all have access to capital. They were all, you know, traveling on private, private, private jets. So it's like, you're just sacrificing yourself in, you know, playing the game this way. Yeah, no, it's totally true. I mean, I think about, uh, I have quite a number of friends and acquaintances who have worked for foundations like the Gates Foundation, for example, and all of the people that I know that like work for the Gates Foundation and travel to sub-Saharan Africa for their jobs, fly business class. Like it is just like mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're going to go eradicate malaria or whatever they're doing and they're flying first class. Right. And so it's just like, just try that on. Right. Like, I, and I can say that as someone who, has a background in like human rights law, like you can't do that work from an, a place of emptiness and a place of, of like, right. like right. personal lack. You have to have like every possible personal, like comfort and resource at your disposal to do that kind of work in the world right. successfully. It's like, I want to say, and just, just let me explain this after I say it, cause it's going to sound horrible. I want women to be more selfish and not like, don't be selfish, but like, can we just tip the the scale a little bit towards that direction so that we can take care of our self, self first so that we are in, are able to go and do the work flying business class and solving. Yeah. And I will disease. also say like, just personally, the most generous people I know are all like the people who, who give to charity and who like volunteer in um, food pantries and like all the people who I know who do the most public service work with their time and their money 
are all people who are financially well off, like right. extremely because they can, because they, yeah, can. because they can, right. Because they don't have to think about how they're going to pay their bills. Like they don't have to think about where they're going to eat yeah. or like yeah. any other healthcare, anything they have that handled. So they have the creative and mental and intellectual abilities to go mm-hmm. and devote their energy on helping people at scale right. and, or helping the environment or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think that's, um, that's a lot of, lots of food for thought there. So (laughs) let's, I want to move into the 8333 project, Jenny, do you want to just maybe share some statistics? We have a new project that we want to announce to everyone and and talk about it. Um, and it kind of started from some statistics that Jenny discovered, uh, I don't know, in your constant search for knowledge, you find things. And well, it's, it's not like super surprising. And again, like this is, I'll share some statistics and data, but you know, there, there, this is just one data set and there's other data sets that are slightly different numbers in this, but just, I want to talk a little bit about the role that women play in the entrepreneurial space or in the business space. And and just like to ground some of these numbers, I think it's quite um, inspiring to hear <laughs> here, like where there's opportunities for massive growth and change. So women in the United States own about 35%, give or take of all businesses. So a, a sizable number, more than one third, which I think is probably surprising for some people, but is also like growing that Whoa, rate is growing. Still, yeah. 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 And that's just the United States, right? So this is not Canada. This is not worldwide, but this is the U S cause that's the most relevant data that we could find. Um, but this, this is the statistic that actually like, you know, kind of brought me to my knees and wanted me to change the direction of like my thought leadership and like our thought leadership collectively and where we were headed with our vision for our company. So that even though women make up 35% of business owners, those businesses that are founded by women or people who identify as women only generate 3.8% of revenue. So like less than 4% of revenue. So these are businesses, there's lots of them, still not half, but like lots of businesses, but they are not making very much money. And I think we all knew this, but to see that or to hear that statistic, like in, you know, like just the cold, hard truth of that really hits home. Like that's appalling to me. Like it's absolutely appalling. How many are making six figures? 12%. So only 12% of businesses, like this is top line revenue. This is not like take home pay or salary to the founder. Um, Only 12% of of women founded companies are bringing in a hundred thousand dollars or more in the United States. So 88% of all businesses founded by women in the U S are bringing in less than a hundred thousand. And that is the business brings in that is top line gross revenue, right? Like that is, that means that like after taxes and expenses, like that is not not a lot of money. Right. And we're, you know, facing increasing inflation, the cost of cost of everything is going up. I just read last night that the cost of food is projected to go up in the next six months by 30 to 40%, the cost of groceries. Like we're living in a world where even a hundred thousand dollars, even if that was your salary, that's getting harder and harder to support a family on. And then to, to continue, you know, we all have this idea. I think that like, well, a lot of those businesses are just like little extra side businesses, But the data also says that 62% of women founded businesses are actually that founder's main source of income. So this is like, this is really getting crisis mode to me. It's like, this is, is a crisis. Yeah. I mean, this is to the point where, um, I mean that to me that we have to like kind of all stop what we're doing and think about that. And are our individual business perpetuating is, is my business perpetuating right. this? I want everyone to ask yes. themselves that because, you know, it may be fine that you're okay right now. And I, I like, as someone who has just dealt with three years of personal, like life crises and it ha- they happen to everyone, you don't know what next year brings or next month brings or tomorrow brings, right? So maybe you have a partner and you have a stable situation going on now, but you have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. And if you are not setting yourself up for financial security, I mean, we're not even saying financial abundance. Like I would love to get us there, but like, this is just 
basic financial security, like you are really putting yourself at risk. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's something that you should, you know, (laughs) think long and hard about, I guess, brand of feminism that we are trying to promote is, is that like, you really should get yourself in a position where you have basic financial literacy. You, you know, you have like emergency savings, you have a plan to be able to support yourself and whomever else you need to support financially as a, you know, as a woman, as a founder. Mm -hmm. And then I think figure out how much that then we can talk about how much do you want (laughs) and like where you want to go. Right, right, right. Um, basics first. Okay. What is our plan to help put a little dent because of this? And because we work in, you know, we largely work in the wellness industry. We work with wellness teachers and coaches and, uh, a lot of folks who historically underprice, we are taking a stand to start to change these numbers. Um, and you know, the average salary it just even for an employed yoga teacher is around 50, $56,000 in the U S. So even in a job, you know, we're not looking at anywhere close to six figures. We want to start to shift the thinking around, you know, six figures in your business should be your baseline minimum. And so like minimum, the floor, and it's absolutely possible. Um, that beauty of the internet is that things are scalable. Startup costs are low. There's a lot of information about how to be successful. And so we are starting something called the 8333 project in, um, in October of 2021, we're going to start testing this project with our inner circle clients and what 8333, why don't you tell us, Sandy, what is the significance of that number? Why 8333? What the heck is that? Well, if you times that by 12 months in a year, you would be making six figures. So yeah. that's the monthly rate that you would need to bring in to make six figures. Yeah. And so we want to get everyone thinking in terms of my minimum that I want to bring in in a month is 8333. And we actually have a curriculum that we're designing to take our clients through who want to sign up and like really commit to the process to get to that first 8333 month for those who aren't there yet. Because part of what we believe is you could do it once you now understand and really viscerally feel that it's possible for you. And it opens up a whole lot of other pathways. So, you know, there's some real tactical advice about what it takes to get to six figures, but there's also a lot of thought work and mindset work that needs to go into changing the way you think about your business, your earning capacity, your worth, your program's worth, yourself, your your relationship to money, all of it, all of that. Yeah. So patriarchy. Yeah. So yeah, I'm super excited about this. And like, like you said, the strategies to get there are not that hard or new. It's just the work around believing it's possible, I think is what's challenging. So we're taking action, right? Like I think the actual steps to take action, really, you have to be willing to be vulnerable and you have to be willing to do things that make you uncomfortable. Yeah. But you can only take action if you believe. Yeah. You cannot sit and like, and we've got lists and reams of reasons people think that they cannot make it. And so that is, that is my work is to kind of like debunk all those, that those literally lies that their brain is telling um, our clients to keep them small and safe and quiet and just don't rock the boat. So yeah, it's going to be super fun. I can't actually, I'm really, really looking forward to it. So um yeah. If, if you want to learn more about the 8333 project, we've, we've put together a training to share more about it. It's, it's a, it's something we're looking to build into a movement. And if you're ready to hop on the six figure train, the six figure super highway, we'd love to have you. Um, you can go learn more about the project at and co slash 8333. And you can find out more information there. Yeah. Check it out. So, so much fun. Okay. Can we do join hustle? I have the joy. I have the joy. I have the joy. I have the joy. Yes. And just beep Sandy. My battery is about to die. So let's make it really fast. (laughs) Okay. All right. So the joy for this week is uh, a website that I discovered as I'm trying to build out this condo and put some less, you know, put some uh, art up the posterclub.com worst name ever. Cause it sounds like 
it's just so boring, but it's actually out of Denmark. I am love, I love the Scandinavian design and like minimal design. These guys have um, like Swedish artists that design for them and they sell them as posters, posterclub.com. Amazing. Excellent. Hustle. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about a Seth Godin blog post that I shared with our inner circle yesterday. It's so good. Okay. So Seth Godin, put out a blog post recently called super famous. And I read Seth's blog every single day. And I encourage anyone who's an entrepreneur or a leader in any way to read Seth's blog. It takes one to five minutes a day. And this blog post is called super famous. And I think it's just like the next iteration of a thousand true fans. And we've talked about that Kevin Kelly article ad nauseum, um, forever on the show but it's just, he's really talking about the problem with trying to be super famous and trying to reach everyone with your work Mm -hmm. and how dangerous it is. And he says, uh, he said the problems with super famous are varied and persistent first, it corrupts the work. So by ignoring the smallest viable audience and focusing on mass, the creator gives up the focus that can create important work. Okay. I totally agree with this This is on message with everything Mm -hmm. that we teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good is the, the infinity of more can become a gaping hole. And it's just basically how it's pers- incredibly personally unfulfilling to never be satisfied, which is also true. And then he also says, um, trust is worth more than attention. And the purpose of the work is to create meaningful change, not to be on a list. Right. So I just think in this age yes. of like yes. Instagram reels and TikTok famous and all of the things like the point is not to have those vanity metrics of like trying to be super famous. The point is Mm -hmm. really to create transformation and change with our work. And that's what's needed in the world. And that's what we each have the unique capability to actually do. I think we need to do a whole other podcast on that because I've got some other thoughts, but I know that your battery is about to die. (laughs) It is about to die. Okay. We will have another podcast on super famous. It will come out. That's a good term. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks. All right. Thanks everyone. everyone.